I think we, we should, it would only be, um, only be right if we would start off by congratulating the new married couple, Cameron and Kim. <clears throat> we um, had a, just a, this felt like, you know, I haven't got to talk to them yet, but I know some of the elders came and um, just felt like it was such a sweet, sweet time together, sweet time of fellowship and, and of the Lord's grace, uh, just this testimony of, of his work. So it was really, really blessed. I know me and Rach and, and the elders as well and them, so that was, was an awesome time. Uh, together yesterday, the, the, we did, you know, film their testimony last week, and uh, I just need to connect with Cameron and figure out how we want to, if we want to post it or if we want to try to get it to where only the family could see it or something like that, not so put it to the whole YouTube world. So, but either way, we'll uh, hopefully get that at some point where we can encourage others with it as well. Um, this is not the one I typically use. Darren, you got this thing rigged up to fit your, your head and your ear, I think. Um, do I? I don't know. I just yeah, I, I took what they gave me, man. That's all I did. I just took what they gave me. Um, okay. Well, last week we we didn't get all the way through the chapter, and so what we'll do this week is just finish up the rest of chapter five, and then get back on to um, you know on the schedule again. There's nothing on the back end pressing us, so we'll go to chapter six next week. So this week we'll just finish up uh, chapter five, loving the stranger. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we we finished up right before. Uh, transitioning from in love to love on 155, right? Is everybody good with that? Okay. I think that's where we ended up. So what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll pray together. Or let's read, the, read uh, Ephesians 5, 25 and 26 together again. And then uh, we'll pray together and we will jump in. Ephesians 5, 25 and 26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Keep going. So that he may present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. This is God's word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the chance uh, to continue this uh, book study together and on um, this important topic of marriage. And, uh, and we thank you for your grace and mercy and how you've already blessed and helped our marriages. And one even that you've used uh, some of this to encourage and to form a new marriage. And so we just pray uh, that we all come in uh, needing, needing grace, needing help, needing wisdom, and uh, thankful and humble and privileged to be able to uh, learn from your word and even th- from um, your servant, uh, Keller, who would, would help us think about your word and what your word says about marriage. So give us help and uh, may, make our marriages more what they're supposed to be so that they could proclaim uh, the, 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 the mysteries of the gospel to the watching world. We praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so 155, we'll pick up Loving the Stranger, um, transitioning from in love to love. And so um, as we've talked about, you know, a lot of times in in this book, we look at this, wait a minute, except for the two rebels by themselves, you guys did good this week. Now, what's funny about it is my parents aren't here and my wife and the kids aren't here. And so I'm wondering, is the trend actually, this is anyway, but y'all just pray for me, all right? Um, I'm kidding. Wifey's getting ready for the trip tomorrow, so she didn't come, and, and uh, my mom was, wasn't feeling well. So, um, You two rebels can stay there being rebels. Congrats are in order, right? Yes, congrats over there. Actually, y'all see that shiny ring when she, she threw the fist up? I think that was intentional. It was like, yeah, yeah, I'm being a rebel. Look at that rock. <laughs> so congrats to you guys, seriously, uh, on your engagement. We're excited, excited for you guys. Love in the air. Um, all right. So transitioning from in love to love. And so you guys really need to pay attention uh, during some of this, this section here. All right, so Keller's getting at, um, again, he's talking about Gary Chapman's five love languages, and he's bringing out um, the nature of this euphoric feeling of feeling in love and feeling like your boyfriend or girlfriend or new spouse or, or fiance walks on water and they can do no wrong and they're just perfect and awesome. And even the bad things about them are just cute and attractive to you. Uh, th- that phase goes away. And all the married people who have been married for a while would say amen. And, uh, and that's what we're talking about. And so, um, so that's kind of where he's at. And he's saying, he's talking about in this section, making the transition from that euphoric feeling of in love to the conscious effort of love, of making effort to give love. So that's kind of where we're at, where he's at. We're picking up in the chapter. And he tells a story uh, about Becky and Brent. Um, and just a story of where Brent, the husband, clearly feels like he's in love with another woman. And uh, comes to the counselor and says, I'm really sorry. I hate that I'm in love with another woman, but I am. I have no feelings for my wife anymore. It was euphoric. It was awesome at one point. Um, but that is gone, and I no longer feel that. And, uh, and so what I feel for this other woman, it's the real deal. And, uh, 
And so I just, what I would want to highlight from that is just how foolish people can be in this euphoric phase. Um, so in this story, and, and because it ends well, I'm, you know, I feel fine to say this guy probably would fully agree. Um, in this story, the guy is saying, you know, he comes to the council saying, oh, well, I had these warm fuzzies for my wife, but now they're gone. I have these warm fuzzies for somebody else, and these are real. And it's so foolish. It's like you've already gone through this once. You're going to have to, and, and, this, and people will do this over and over and over. And, uh, and so there, there's just a foolishness to thinking that high is what actually love is. And so that's what, that's what Keller's getting into. And down on about halfway down, or three-quarters of the way down on 156, just above the quote. But eventually the high wears off, and then love must become a deliberate choice. And so that's, the again, the section we're in. There is a moment where the high, as, as much as you might be floating in the clouds right now, there's a moment where the, the floating ends, and your feet hit the floor, and now there's a decision of will I choose love? Will I choose to give love in action uh, and, and choose love and not just, quote-unquote, feel love? Um, so the quote from, I think, it would be helpful to read it. The quote from Chapman there on the bottom of 156 um, and top of 157. Let's read it together. After the euphoria wears off, if our spouse has learned to speak our primary love language, our need for love will continue to be satisfied. If, on the other hand, he or she does not speak our love language, our tank will slowly drain and will no longer feel loved. Meeting that need is definitely a choice. If I learn the emotional love language of my spouse and speak it frequently... When she comes down from the obsession of the in-love experience, she will hardly even miss it because her emotional love tank will continue to be filled. However, if I've not learned her primary love language or have not chosen, to, uh, chosen not to speak it, when she descends from the emotional high, she will have the natural yearnings of unmet emotional needs. After some years of living with an empty love tank, she will likely fall in love with someone else and the cycle will begin again. And so what Chapman is saying here is that if the if there's not an intentional choice of moving towards one and, and learning how does she hear love what's her love language how can I speak and do things in such a way that they receive love and if, if that doesn't happen then eventually the love tank in, in Chapman's language it will go empty and then the, the, the one spouse that with the empty tank is going to go looking for that elsewhere and so this is what we see over and over and over and, uh, and, and so this is where it's important you know and what he's going to do in the rest of a lot of this chapter is start talking about different love languages and how some people feel affection so it's helpful especially if you're here with your spouse or have been talking through this with your spouse to figure out okay what are what are some of my love languages so this is it just gives us some categories to, to think through it's really really helpful um, he says over 157 uh, same thing about three quarters of the way down at first love sweeps you up but involuntarily but eventually love is a deliberate choice in um, next paragraph we should not think that this example teaches that all marriage problems can be solved by the discipline of discerning love languages and providing love in the most fitting forms. The human heart is infinitely complex. Marriage difficulties can come from deep-seated patterns of idolatry, from semi-conscious anger, and from fear that needs to be rooted out with counseling and God's grace. So he says, just because we hear this good story, we don't need to think, oh, well, that's just all we need to do, and bam, all of our problems will be fixed. No, sometimes there really is. There's some wounds, there's some deep-seated idolatry, there's some blind spots that may need a unique move of God's grace and then even counseling, you know, meeting with a pastor or getting some help to deal with some of those things. So he, he gives that warning, but I do want to flip to, if you've got your Bibles, if not, I'll read it to you, but flip to Jeremiah 17, 9, the verse that he talked about. And, uh, and I just want to give you a little bit of a, a pastoral warning, um, prophetic warning to say this is, this is kind of the opposite of what our culture would tell you. And I, and I think, again, this is, we, we take some of the culture's thoughts about love and marriage and relationships into our marriage and, and we believe and, and would listen to culture and so we get into marriage we get confused instead of saying let's, let's listen to what scripture says so the phrase that I would say is culture says just follow your heart right just follow your heart this is, I mean you see this all over the place right just follow your heart when, if you don't know what to do just follow your heart now let's read Jeremiah 17 9 and see what Jeremiah has to say about that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick who can understand it so Jeremiah would say, your heart is desperately sick, wicked or deceitful in all things. Now this is talking about a, a non-Christian, a dead heart, it's not about a person without Christ. But our, our heart before Christ, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? So for the world to say, hey, follow your heart, the world's telling you to follow something that's deceitful above all things and desperately sick. And so this is bad advice when the world says, follow your heart. 
If your heart is set on the things of Christ, if your heart's been redeemed and you're looking to Christ and you're looking to His will, that's a great thing. So Psalm 37.4, you might want to write that down or think about that one on the other side of it. Psalm 37.4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. So you have this, there, there's a little bit of complexity of, okay, God, which one is it? My heart's deceitful or delight myself in the Lord and He'll give me the desires of my heart. Which, what, what do I do with this tension? Now, again, Jeremiah 17, we read in context, it's talking about a wickedness and rebellious heart. And, and we'll, we'll read the whole thing in a second. Psalm 37.4 is, delight yourself in the Lord and He'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, you know what happens when you delight? That's the reason we chose that for the D. When you delight in God, well, He changes your heart to want what He wants. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, your heart begins to want what He wants. So He gives you what you want. Because you're delighting in Him. So He changes your wants to want what He wants and He gives you what you want. Whereas Jeremiah 17, 9 is our natural depraved hearts that we want to be away from God. We want to be our own gods. We want to reject Him. And so that's, that's the tension that we have in the Bible. Now as Christians, if you're a Christian today and you're here, the Christian would be you've got this dual thing going on. And we see this from Paul in, in Romans 7, right? Why do I not do the things I know I should? And I, I do the things I know I shouldn't. And, and, and he kind of says, you know, who can deliver us from this, this body of death? He says this, this going back and forth. The flesh wants me to do this. The spirit wants me to do this. Who can deliver me? And he says, thanks be to God. So there is this, as we're Christians and as we grow, we're fighting at the same time an old, dead Jeremiah 17, 9 heart that's in us, but this new Psalm 37, 4 heart that's growing within us and becoming more of who we are. And so there's an there's a internal battle that we're going to fight. Our old ways, our old man, our old way of thinking, we're going to put it to death. And we're going to feed the new man with God's word. And we're going to delight in God and he's going to give us his heart. So there's always going to be these tensions going on. So when you hear the culture say, follow your heart, in general the culture is saying that to everybody. Well, most hearts, all hearts that haven't been redeemed by Christ, are rejecting God, replacing him, worshiping idols, and destined for hell. And the word would say, follow that. Now, this, is, this is not good advice. <laughs> and so for us, when we hear that, it's like, hey, Lord, what does it mean? What part of my heart can I follow? Well, the part that's delighting in the Lord, you follow that one. And, and so that's, again, that's why we've looked at the, 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 the freedom in four Ds. Look at Jeremiah 17 while we're there, and we've got some extra time because we've only got half of a chapter here. Um, we kind of walk through Jeremiah 17, 5 through... Um, about 18 I don't know I'll read it and it'll hopefully come to my mind as I'm reading it I'll remember all this this is one part of prep so we're gonna we're gonna wing it see how it goes all right Jeremiah 17 starting verse 5 thus says the Lord cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength whose heart turns away from the Lord so we start off with cursed is the man who trusts in man that's the cursed man so we're gonna have we're gonna have this dual thing going on as we look through the passage cursed is that man he's like a shrub in the desert and he shall not see any good come he shall dwell in the parched place of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. So we've got the cursed man. Now, look at verse um, 7. Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He's like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when the heat comes, for its leaves remain green and it is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. So we've got the cursed man who trusts in man. We've got the blessed man who trusts in God. So you got, it says, who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. So the blessed man is the one who looks to and trusts God. The cursed man is the one who trusts in man. And the, then the, the cursed man is going to bear bad fruit. So he's in the desert. So he's going to be a thorn bush, all right? So I just want you to get these pictures. And this is actually, uh, at some point I'm going to teach you guys kind of biblical counseling, how to think about how do we change and how do we grow. And, and this is the, the, the metaphor, the illustration will be built out of this passage. So you've got the cursed man who trusts in man. So his heart is a bad heart. We see it in Jeremiah 17, 9. It's deceitful. It's wicked. His heart is wicked. Now, when you think about the heart, you think about beliefs, you think about motives. So what does my heart believe? The scriptures, when it says heart, it's talking about heart, soul, mind. Usually it's all talking about the same thing. It's the inner man. That's what it's talking about, the inner man. So cursed is the man who, in his heart, in his soul, in his mind, in his inner man, trusts in man. He believes in man rather than believing in God. What happens is he puts his faith and trust in man, and then the fruit of his life is a thorn bush. He's like a, a you know, ugly thorn bush planted out in the desert. Nothing but little pricklies on it, nothing pretty about it. Nobody's going to buy that and go put it in their house for decoration, right? Just ugly. So he's got a bad heart, and that shows itself up in a bad life. 
the bad life grows out of the bad heart. So Jesus says in, in the Gospels, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Got a bad heart, thorn bush grows up here. So we got roots, fruit. Then, and then the second was the bl blessed man. He's who trusts in the Lord. He's like a plant that's, that's, that's uh, by streams, and his roots go deep and out to the streams, and lots of fruit comes from his life. So the picture in Jeremiah 17 is, there is there's two different types of, of hearts in this scenario. The wicked heart that trusts in man, the good heart that trusts in the Lord. The wicked heart that trusts in man grows bad fruit in his life. The good heart that trusts in the Lord, good fruit in his life. And so the question is, well, how do you go from one to the other? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Like the partridge that gathers a, a brood that she did not hatch, so is he who gets riches but not justified. Let's keep going. A glorious throne. <clears throat> heal me. So here, here's gospel. Where does it come in? Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Behold, they say to me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come. I have not run away from being your shepherd, nor have I desired the day of sickness. You know what came out of my lips. It was before your face. Be not a terror to me. Let those be put to shame. But the, the healing comes in that first, in verse 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. So we all start with the Jeremiah 17, 9, bad heart. It grows bad fruit. So if you want to know if you're a Christian, you look at the fruit on your life. Now, you don't become a Christian by changing the fruit. You become a Christian by changing the heart. God changes the heart, and all of a sudden we have good fruit. Bad heart, bad fruit, good heart, good fruit. And so verse 14 shows us, where's the gospel come in? Heal me, O Lord. We started heal, here, heal me. Give me a new heart, change me. So all that to say, therefore, when the culture comes in and says, follow your heart, you need to know that's probably not good advice unless you're thinking through massive grids. So, all right, sermonette over, and we'll get there uh, one day. That, that, that grid is really helpful. It's in a book, written in a book, which I'm going to get in the book nook eventually, called How People Change. And it just goes through, well, how is it, how is it that we change? And basically it's understanding our hearts our beliefs, our motives, and then how that shows forth in our actions and understanding how the gospel comes in and God takes away the bad heart and gives us more and more of the new heart. So, all right, there you go. 158, so we ended up there. Because our culture, last sentence there, above affection, because our culture thinks of love as mainly an involuntary feeling and not a conscious action, the foundational skill is often missed entirely. So basically the foundational skill of actually displaying and consciously giving love. A lot of times it's missed altogether because we primarily think about love as an involuntary feeling. So we think that's a feeling we can't control when it's actually a skill that we should cultivate. We think love primarily is an emotion rather than an action. And so we got to cultivate this. So he's going to go through and run through some love languages here. And um, just different categories are really practical and really helpful. So under that affection on 158, anything stand out to you guys from that as particularly helpful or... Um, you know, anything you'd want to point to or highlight or share from that section? The word affection speaks a lot. Absolutely. You know, I underlined, fellas, let me, um, I'm going to step on y'all's toes the most because I'm one of you. And so when I read the book, it gets on me. So I, I just can't get on you. Um, even making the effort, so about halfway down, even making the effort to arrange these are an important sign of expression in love. My wife and I, usually when I hurt her the most, it's not that um, I was mean to her or, um, you know, I've, just the nature of our dynamic, I've never raised my voice at her. It's, it's never usually any of that. It's you didn't think for me. That's the phrase that I immediately, I'm crushed because I know she's crushed. And it's, we went out on a date, we went out to dinner and a movie or something, but You've been thinking for the church. You've been thinking for everybody else. You're trying to help everybody else. And you just didn't take 10 minutes and plan a date for us. We were winging it. We are just winging the date. When you could have just taken 10 minutes and just plan the date. I don't care where we go or what we do, but just that you would have given enough time to plan it. And, uh, and man, as soon as it happens, I know. It's like, oh, I've done it again. And, uh, and so, but, but for her, that really is, for Rachel, that's a massive love language. That I would just set aside some time to plan for her what we're going to do. What's funny is that there's very few, my girl is so low maintenance. I mean, she just is. It really, it really doesn't matter what we do. It's just that I would set aside some time to plan what we're going to do. And then she feels like a queen. And, uh, and so that's, you know, when I read this first section, I, I would just say to the men, you know, like, think for your girl. Make a plan. 
Take her out on a date. I promise you, you know, it's going to happen. And she, she may, for some of you, she's going to look at you and be like, something wrong with you? Like, what, what did you do that you're about to apologize for? <laughs> um, but seriously, like, do that. Show some affection by just coming up with a date, taking her out to dinner, and, and having a plan. Actually have a conversation about getting to know her better. Just think through one thought. What could I do and ask her about? And, uh, and I promise you, it'll go, it'll go a long way in your, your relationship, displaying affection. So, um, we must learn to send messages of love in direct, personal, specific, and ever-fresh ways. Discern the strengths and gifts of your partner and communicate honest praise, appreciation, and thankfulness for him or her. The flip side of this form of love is refraining from harsh and critical words. So come up with things you can praise in your spouse. Authentic ones, real ones. So, you know, if your lady it don't belong in the kitchen and you're like, yo, you're such a great cook, she's going to know you're lying. <laughs> And so don't do that. This is not what this is talking about. Now, if she's a good cook and she cooks a great meal, you brag on her, you, you encourage her, you, you affirm her. Um, so come up with real authentic praise and encouragement, thankfulness that you would have um, in those moments. And then the flip side, refrain from harsh and critical words. You just need to chuck those out of your vocabulary with your spouse. Um, again, you need to think about your bride. So husbands, you need to think about your bride as God Almighty's daughter. And you need to speak to her in such a way that if God the Father was present, he'd be okay with how you're talking to his daughter. Vice versa. Women, you should respect your husbands and speak to your husbands as if God Almighty was there evaluating how you are submitting to the church and representing the church, submitting to, the, to Christ. And so that should change how we interact, even in a conflict. It might mean we gotta, we gotta step away and cool out before we can have, actually have some of the interaction in the conflict. So harsh words, and, and I, even with this one, I'd wanna bring up... Um, you know, if in all the premarital counseling I do or will do, have done, the D words, and it's, that's, that word's not allowed. Diver, divorce is never allowed in conversation. That's never a threat. That's, a, you, that's, that's an off-limit concept, and so it's an off-limit word. If it's, a, if, it's, if it's not an off-limit word, what that means is it's an option currently. Uh, you're really headed there. And, uh, and so this is, you know, when it's talking about affection, it's, you don't bring that one out. That, that's a... That's a as divisive, attacking. That's the church saying to Christ, Jesus, if you don't do better, I'm out on you. And so that, that word itself, that, that cannot, that disrupts unity, it disrupts an ability to have a covenant. So if that's something you've practiced in your, in your conflicts, I would urge you, stop. Don't, that, that, that can't be an option word in your vocabulary um, in those moments because what it does is destroy affection. So even in your own heart, as you say that to your spouse, you're destroying your heart's ability to love your spouse because of what you're doing in those moments. You're so, such a superior love for self that you're so punishing the other one because you're looking out for yourself that you're fracturing the oneness. And uh, the whole goal of marriage is to become one. And so in that moment, you're driving a wedge and you're making the one become two. So let's make sure we fight to, uh, to be careful with our words, positively and negatively. So pour out real, true, authentic affection and let's avoid harsh and critical words that would destroy our relationship. Um... <clears throat> Friendship. What about the section on friendship? Anything stand out to you guys in that one? 159? Hang on, Rick. Mike's coming. It's not on. Is it on? Eddie, you have my man a dead mic. Come on, man. <laughs> oh, it's maybe on mute. Check, it check, just check, on mute. check, 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 check. Eddie, I'm, I apologize. Rick just didn't take it off mute. I apologize. Forgive me, please. Let's model it. That was not on either. <laughs> We're going to have my class next. <laughs> <laughs> Look, now ain't nobody else speaking the rest of the time. You're not handing me that mic. <laughs> Rick, sorry. Go for it. Okay. Let's talk about above all, show your spouse the time with him or her his priority in your life. Mm. Um, something that we found important that's happened this summer is that I'm off one every Friday right now. And so we were talking about Friday. We're driving up to Winston-Salem to see Andrew and Catherine. And we are just talking about how, how much we're enjoying being able to spend the time with just each other mm. and weeks ago we spent time out in the garden or whatever but it's just given us the time to uh to do that because it lets us know that that 
she is my priority. I'm her priority, and, and I just think that's important. Absolutely. That's great. It's helpful there where he talks about being engaged. Um, is it in this one? No, never mind. I'm about to skip. Um, so it's crucial for the husband to be emotionally engaged and deeply interested in helping his wife make the house a home and a haven. Um, love can additionally be expressed by sharing each other's mental world, reading books together, even aloud. I just know for uh, Kim and Cameron, I know that was, as, as we met, that was one of the huge things to them that they started reading this book together out loud. And that was, just had massive impact on the relationship. And um, so for the husbands that are here, um, then I would say to you, um, read the book. Don't come sit in here and your wife read it and you just show up for the discussion. Read the book. So a lot of you are giggling because you're in trouble, right? Wifey's like, I told you. <laughs> but seriously, again, you know, and I, I say that because it's an issue. Spiritually in general, when it comes to um, spiritual or intellectual work, men typically are lazy. We just are. So especially I think more in the small town world where we'll go work our tail off physically. You know, we pride ourselves. On, uh, like, sorry, this whole section just laughing. So I'm not, I'm not picking on y'all. I'm just, I'm just enjoying the laughter. <laughs> so, but my point is literally that the church is in a state that it is because the men aren't leading the way in spiritual growth. They're letting the women do that. Now they're killing it, working on fixing the house and all those things. And so, amen. So keep killing it in those categories. But we have to be willing to work hard. And so I would say, read these books with your wives. Don't expect her to develop the marriage for you by reading the books and giving you the cliff notes. Hey, babe, give me the highlights right before we go over, and that way I can, I can discuss it with Clint. I see faces over here turning red. Um, no, but seriously, read them together, discuss it together, grow spiritually together. It's going to help your friendship work together. So ladies, go join him out there whenever he's doing some of the, the work on the house. Um, but I think here's, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to stop and let this section have a mediation time. Y'all just go up there and y'all talk about it. All right, y'all go work it out. Are you about to comment here? No. <laughs> oh, help you. I was, yeah, I was connected. Okay, there we go. He's clean. Okay, that's wrong. See, now y'all just, y'all need to go have a conversation, all right? Y'all just go work that out, all right? Oh, anyway, you crazy people. All right. Um, read books together. That's all I'm trying to do, read books together. This, I mean, just read books together. Um, <laughs> yeah, my, my calendar's got booked, didn't it? All right. Um, yeah, so again, Cameron and Ken, I did, you know, seriously, they just shared how impactful that had been to them, reading out loud together. I know my mom and dad, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm, I love, my, okay, my relationship with my dad is awesome. That's my dude. So he led me to Christ. He taught me the scriptures growing up. I love my dad, but that brother does not read, all right? So he, He's similar, like he'll work harder than anybody, and he worked three jobs to keep us from starving growing up. So I got nothing but respect for him. But when it comes to books, he's about as lazy as you can get. And, uh, and he, would, he would, if he was here, he would be laughing and nodding his head. Um, but I know for him and mom, they've actually been reading this out loud together, and it's been great for him. And, uh, and he don't read books, and, uh, and it's been really, really good for their marriage. And, um, and God has done amazing work even in their marriage. There's such a testimony to where a place they were when, when I was a kid and what God did and and they're best of friends now and have a great marriage. And uh, they've come a long way in some just awesome, awesome ways. So all to say, men, uh, read, read, read the books out loud together with your wives. That's what it takes. Um, listening to one another, sharing one another. You know, in general, men, we don't, we don't do this. We, we, we hide our weaknesses. We pretend like we're not weak, and, um, which just means we're lying. And um, the Apostle Paul was the beastiest, manliest man ever. And he says, I'll boast of my weaknesses. So if you want to be a real man, you got to be willing to, uh, to be vulnerable and talk about those things. So do that with your wife as well. Help your friendship. All right, service. Now, now maybe, men, we can jump on the wives. Or, well, not really. Y'all just, no, y'all just lose. Um, all right, 160. I'm always going to jump on the men. I mean, men need to, to step up. Service. Um, anything stand out from that section before I, I got a lot of notes, but before I read them, anything stand out to y'all? I got a, a quasi-confession right here. No, it's a full-out confession. 
the last sentence in the first paragraph, I misread it at first, and I was excited. And I reread it and was like, oh, I'm such a jerk. Um, so the first time I read it, last, last sentence, I'm going to read it to you the way I read it the first time. For example, it means happily changing diapers and helping with the house cleaning when being asked. And then I realized, oh, it says without being asked. <laughs> and so I was like, yeah, that's right. She needs to, oh, it says without. She don't, she's not supposed to ask me. I'm supposed to do it. So anyway, uh, I was a loser on that one. So I circled it. I, I circled the without and uh, was reminded of my utter failure when it comes to diapers. All right. Um, Serving your spouse also means showing him her great respect. It means giving your spouse the confidence you always speak up and stand up for him, that you show loyalty and appreciation for her before other family and friends. This is massive. So there are some cultural family dynamics. When the husbands get together, all they do is bash the wives. Wives get together, and they just bash the husbands. And this is families, family time, get-togethers. That's, that's literally atrocious and destroys marriages. So you should never bash your spouse in front of anybody about anything, period. Period. Your spouse needs to know their weaknesses from you. Nobody else needs to know it. It's gossip and slander every time. So if you get together and, and you get together, either with your friends, family members, whatever it is, I say family because in general, again, small town world, most families all together. Um, if, if that becomes a bashing time, you leave the room or you correct it, but don't let it go on and definitely don't contribute. Because all that's doing is just poison. That's like drinking a bottle of gasoline and thinking it's not going to affect your body. It's going to destroy. Because what's going to happen is, you know, complainers love one another, right? You start complaining around somebody and they like to complain too, and it's like, good night. Your husband went from he forgot to take out the trash to he's the lowest piece of dirt on the face of the planet. And all he did was forget to take out the trash. But 30 minutes into the conversation, he's the greatest jerk there is. And you go to him with more bitterness and resentfulness in your heart than you did before it started. And so this, and same thing, other side, you know, if men, if men are doing that, complaining about whatever men would complain about in those moments, end it. You cannot do this in those moments. So we must be our spouse's biggest fan when we're not with our spouse, or our marriage will fall apart. So when you're with other people, may they see your spouse in the greatest light possible through you, and, uh, and you do the work to make that happen. And uh, so just, just make sure you do that. Give your spouse the confidence that you always speak up and stand up for him or that you will show loyalty and appreciation for her before other family and friends. <clears throat> so, you know, to the fellows, I would say, you make, you make your girl feel, feel that she's, uh, every time her name is on your lips, it's safe. It's always safe. And, and vice versa. Um, serving your spouse also means showing that you're committed to his or her well-being and flourishing. This kind of love is given when you seek to help your spouse develop gifts and pursue aspirations for growth. Same thing, biggest fan. Now, I, I feel like I learned this lesson in college uh, when I'm, this language I'm using, biggest fan. So I was in a discipleship group with some buddies in college, and, um, and one of my best friends, he ended up being my best friend in college. He and I both were from small towns, and y'all have heard me make this joke before. If you're, if you're just an above average athlete in a small town, you're a superstar, because there's, you're in a small town, right? So it don't, you don't have to be that talented to be a superstar in a small town. That's just kind of the way it is. So he and I was both kind of from that background, whereas we thought we were a whole lot better than either one of us was. And you get to UNC Charlotte, and there's 20,000 of those people, and you realize, yeah, I wasn't that good. I thought I was back in Shelby, but now I realize I'm a dime a dozen. So we're one of those. But the problem is we're athletes, so we're competitive. We're always, you know, it don't matter what we're doing, we're competing something. So it can be, you know, like, well, who's getting the most food at the calf, you know? And I mean, whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just stupid. This is dudes, right? You're just idiots, and you just compete on anything. If, if somebody can win and lose, I'm in. You know what I mean? That's just the way it works. So anyway, that's us. We're freshmen. We're morons. And um, no offense to those you are, but I love you. And I was too. But, um, and so we're there. We're freshmen, and we're competing about everything. And I remember having these discipleship groups where we'd sit down, and I, at some point, I just got sick of it. Because I'm like, bro, like, we're trying to walk with Christ. Why are we competing in this? Like, we should be, and I just feel like the Lord, like, we should be each other's biggest fan. So I don't need to be competing with glory for you. I should be your biggest fan when we're at intramural basketball and you're dominating. I should be more happy than anybody else in the room because you're my dude. And we're in this together. We're growing. We're trying to like, let's quit competing with one another and let's compete against Satan. Let's like, let's have the right battles. And so the same thing should be true in marriage. You should be your, your spouse's greatest fan. So when she does anything good, it should make you more happy than anybody on the planet watching. Vice versa. 
and you should cheer for it. You know what I mean? Like you, you're, you're the loudest one at the game screaming for them. You know, you're, you're not, um, <laughs> let me poke some fun because I know I'm going to get some of y'all in here for this one. Um, and probably me eventually later so y'all can hammer me later. But you're not the parent who sits in the stands at the, at the games screaming at your kids like they're the other team. This is what I don't get about. You go to games and it's like you're like, come on, what are you doing? It's like you're talking to your kid. Like you're supposed to be pulling for them. What do you mean? Yeah, she meant to throw the ball out of bounds, or, or he meant to throw the football to the other team. Come on, man. Like, he didn't do it on purpose. What do you mean? What is he doing? He made a mistake. Do you ever make, like, anyway, sorry. So, but, but you, you, this happens, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I mean, y'all get serious about some high school sports, and I do too, and so, again, my kids are going to be there, and y'all are going to, ha, now it's on you, and amen, and I'll sit down and say you're right. Um, and so y'all just, I give anybody permission. As soon as I start doing that, just slap me in the back of the head. And I'll, I'll immediately know what happened and I'll just sit down and shut up. Um, but anyway, in those moments, it's like, wait a minute, we should be their biggest fan. Not their biggest critic. Like we should be, I don't know, big upping them. That's a hip hop term. So I just, We should just be their biggest fan. We should be the one that's cheering the loudest for their success, not hammering their failure. Same way in marriage. We should be the ones cheering for our spouse the most. When he or she does something right, we should be the ones cheering the loudest. And then when they do something wrong, we come speaking truth and love as the rest of the chapters can get into. And we correct it because we're seeking for their best, not just because we're mad that they didn't score a touchdown. <clears throat> I don't know. Again, this is, somehow this always come back to Bill Cosby's. Uh, 1970s, Bill Cosby's himself. That thing is just brilliant. One, it's good art. He gets comedy. And he talks about his, his son taking over the family business, scoring touchdowns and 700,000 fans, and he gets really exaggerating. But anyway, it's a tangent, but, uh, but I feel I identify Bill Cosby and all that. So let's be biggest fans, and uh, y'all have no idea what I'm talking about, so let's keep moving. All right, uh, this kind of love, we saw that. And all right, one of the greatest expressions of love is the willingness to change. Let me read that again. One of the greatest expressions of love is the willingness to change. One of the greatest expressions of love is the willingness to change. So I'll keep going now. To make a commitment to change attitudes and behaviors in yourself that trouble or hurt your spouse. This is just a big deal, guys. We get, um, and again, I, I want to, it can be a little awkward because I'm a younger pastor, um, but particularly to those who aren't young. You can conclude, I'm, I am who I am, and you just need to adjust because I'm too old for that change and stuff. That's just not acceptable, biblically speaking. So until you're in glory and you're perfect, that's when you can stop changing. But until then, you should be changing. And any ways you hurt your spouse, you should be changing. And you just got to be willing to commit that. You got to be willing to do that and, and, and make that change. So, and it and goes on, there must be an ability to take correction and be accountable for real, concrete change. This kind of change is always hard and nearly impossible without the grace of God. But it's also one of the most powerful signs of love in a marriage. So you can change. No matter who you are, what you're like, you can change. This is the hope of the gospel. And this is hope as a spouse you can change. You can be a better spouse a year from now than you are today. And, uh, and that's, that's where there's hope. So, but you've got to commit to being willing to take concrete steps that, can be, that you can be held accountable to. And say, hey, babe, I need to change. And here's a category I know I need to change. And so I'm telling you, I'm making an effort. I need you to encourage me because I'm stuck in my ways and I don't want to do that but I want to because God's convicting me because I love you. So when, when you see me slipping, please encourage me to, to press on. And you have those kind of interactions. All right. Praying daily at the end, praying daily with and for each other is a, a love language that in many ways brings the other love languages together. Um, I was, when I read that just a while ago, I was thinking, so me and Rachel usually pray. Um, we pray together, you know, at every meal with the babies and, and with one another if they're not up. We, we pray together every almost, I mean, there's probably been you know, a few dozen, I would imagine, since seven, eight years of marriage that we haven't prayed together at night. But in general, almost every night that we've been married, we pray together. Um, and by that, one of us prays. Um, more often than not, me, but, but sometimes I'll be like, hey, babe, pray. And, I, and we just pray simple prayers. They're nothing super spiritual. It's thank you for the day, Lord. And we're praying for people that are on our hearts, you know, briefly. It's a real short, brief prayer, but we pray together. And, um, and that's just been a consistent thing in our marriage that from day one, I was like, Lord, I want to commit to this. I want to pray with my bride every night. And uh, like I said, we've missed, we've missed, you know, days here and there. But in general, that's the time we always pray together. But I was reading this, I was thinking, uh, especially families with kids, you know, how great would it be if we took turns 
rotating praying for the other person um, every morning or at night or something. And, you know, tonight I pray for Eden, and Eden prays for Nias, and Nias prays for Mommy, and Mommy prays for Daddy. And we would just do that and then rotate and change um, what that would do to the intimacy in our family and, and, and then particularly in marriage. And so I would encourage you to pray with. I think Rachel and I pray with each other a lot, but not for. That's what stood out to me, praying for one another out loud together. Um, that I'm like, we, just, we don't do that very often. I do it sometimes in moments of need. But in general, we pray with each other, but we don't pray for each other out loud very often. And um, so I just, just thought about that, thought I'd share and say, hey, you know, maybe, maybe you guys decide to do that. Maybe that really does help, uh, help stir up some more intimacy and love uh, and serving each other in that way. And men, you've got to lead the way. You're the spiritual leader of the household, so you need, you need to lead in prayer. Um, you know, uh, next on 161, last paragraph there, this is by no means a de- uh, definitive list of love languages or currencies. Another example might be allowing your spouse privacy either for a brief or longer periods, depending on emotional needs. I want to say a word about conflict. Um, so some of us are more, uh, we get in conflict, and you guys probably heard some of this. Some of us are fight, and other of us choose flight. So some of us, it's like we sense a conflict coming, and it's like, all right, let's get it. Like, we're, I'm, that's just our approach, right? I'm going to get my defenses ready. I'm going to get my argument going. Pow, 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 I win. Like, that's just our fleshly response. Others, it's like, It's like, I, I, so I'm just running away and hiding. I'm not going to acknowledge this fight. I'm a, it's just this silent violence, right? It's like this, I'm staring a hole through, hole through you, but we're not talking about it. And so you just run away and hide, and you don't want to face the conflict. So we got to know different people are going to respond to conflict in different ways. Now, we don't need to do either of those two things, just FYI. Um, we, need to, we need to, by grace, approach one another and reconcile. But I thought it was helpful, and I thought it would be good to say this in saying, sometimes, so... Again, I'll share me and me and wifey. Um, I'm a verbal processor, so I just want to talk it out, and we can just roll. And in general, you know, this is where just how God's wired me up. Like I think better when I'm talking with you about it. Like that helps me get to the conclusion. Um, for her, it's like if we try to do it on the spot, it, it, her mind just goes blank, and it's like I can't. Like, I can't respond to you. Right? I can't, like, I just can't think as quick as you're rolling with it. It's because I'm, when I'm moving about 15 different levels and all these different routes and sins and how could it be this and da 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 and she's just like, okay, just stop. Like, I can't, I cannot go there like that. So for her, if we're in a conflict and she can't, sometimes the most loving thing for me to do is to give her some space and let her go process. In general, with a pen, she's amazing. So when she writes, man, she's just such a good communicator. So sometimes she needs to go journal pray to the Lord, think through what, what's wrong because it might be like, you hurt my feelings and I'm like, okay, what did I do? And it's like, I don't know. You know, and it's like, well, so then I just start asking questions over and over and over and, and you know, then she feels cornered and like I'm attacking her and I'm like, no, I'm just trying to figure out what I did. And, um, and so for her, it's like, I, you know, sometimes I just need to give her some space, her to go away, journal, pray. And then we come back and she's like, and she might say, actually, it wasn't a big deal. I was being silly. Da, da, da. Or it was, this is what you did, and this is why it hurt. And then I immediately know, and I'm able to say, I'm sorry, we forgive me, and we're able to move forward. So in general, I just say, sometimes it might be the most loving thing you do to give your spouse a little bit of space and say, hey, you know, like, if you need some process time to go do that, that's great. Let's come back together and talk about it in a few hours. Now, in general, Ephesians says, don't let the sun go down your anger. I, that principle to me needs to stay in place, so don't go to bed angry at your spouse. Again, it's a way, you, you do that consistently, it's a way to erode at your marriage. Now that means, for us, that's meant conversations till three, four in the morning sometimes when I got to get up at six or seven. But it's like I'm not, I'm not going to bed angry at my girl. We're going to reconcile, and, and we're going to get there. And if I have a bad day at work, I have a bad day at work. If I get fired, I get fired. I'd rather stay married and get, and get fired. So we're, we're just going to do that. And um, so that's kind of what we've always committed to is talking through it until we can at least reconcile and be for one another. Whether that's we got it all, you know, put together night and nice and neat, not necessarily the case, but it's at least our hearts are together. We want reconciliation. We've, we've offered forgiveness, and we're, we're, we're at peace to where we can go to sleep and talk any other details we need to on the next day. So there you go. Um, the task before you is difficult but simple. What a true sentence. Difficult but simple. So it's really simple. This is not rocket science, but it is hard to do. Difficult but simple. Learn your spouse loves language. Figure out together what they are, then brainstorm a handful of concrete ways to regularly give love in those forms. Then execute, concretely give love to each other in deliberate ways every week. Let me give, a, let me give 
you guys a phrase that I heard um, C.J. Mahaney, the guy that wrote the book Living the Cross Center Life I listened to a uh, it's a leadership seminar or something he did and at some point he spent some time talking about how to love your family well and he said that he realized once he did this he was a, such a better husband and it's one of those things where I'm going to be convicted as soon as I tell you because I haven't been doing it and it's so simple that somebody should just punch me in the face um, but he says this is what I do every Monday morning he has some planning time so he wakes up on Monday he's planning out his week looking at his schedule figuring out what he's doing which you know if you work at 5 a.m. it's a little different but he's a pastor and so he's got Monday morning his kind of planning day office day etc he says he takes 15 to 30 minutes every Monday morning two things that he's thinking about for his wife how can I serve her and how can I surprise her every week every Monday morning 15 minutes just what's some ways I could serve my wife this week and what's, what, what's one way I could surprise her this week and he says just since he's been doing that his marriage is just a whole other place just by 15 minutes a week thinking how can I serve and how can I surprise and um, so I challenge the men to do that it does it, you might be able to do it in 5 minutes it's just come up with a way to think what could I do that would serve her this week that she would feel helped that she would feel loved and then what could I do that would surprise her maybe I stop through Aldi and get some flowers and the people all think there's something wrong with my marriage because I got my girl some flowers. <laughs> and what'd you do to it? You know, it's like, you're in a doghouse. And I said, no, I'm actually just seeking to surprise my wife because I love her. And uh, so serve and surprise, serve and surprise. Maybe you guys could just memorize those two and think, and how can I serve and surprise my wife this week? All right, the great problem. Now, what he's going to get into in 161 here, um, 163, which I'll stop and see if you guys got anything. But 161 and 163, he's going to get into the great problem is okay we're called to speak the truth in love and the great problem is that we can do one or the other without the other and particularly speaking the truth without love we, that means we've got the most powerful weapons against our spouse to injure and hurt them and that because we know the deepest truths about them that can hurt them and so then if we bring them we can cause the most damage so anything stand out to you from one, 161 to 163 there in that section The power of the problem. Oh, yep. Okay. Um, Mike. Yep. Is it working? Okay. Um, I guess on page 164, just about um, where the Bible says that we're supposed to forgive people and then confront them. Mm. Like, normally, that's backwards from what we do. We mm. confront and then explode and then mm. maybe forgive later. You're right. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. It's true. That's, that, you know, I was, I was, that stuck out to me too as well. That we have the responsibility before God, which this changes kind of everything, right? Um, it's jumping a little ahead, of, but we'll follow the thought there. This changes everything. Because what this means is somebody who's wounded us, we need to forgive them even if they never apologize to us. And that changes kind of everything. So even if they never say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? We're supposed to give forgiveness in our hearts. Now, we don't have it. I think he gets at that. It's an alien power from another world, is what he says, from another world. It's got to be the forgiveness of Christ that he's given that we can tap into that reservoir and to give the forgiveness. But yeah, I think we do. We go confront out of a desire for vengeance and justice, not out of, I've already forgiven you, so now I'm coming for your good in this moment. Which is like, how drastically does that alter a, conf a confrontation completely different because you're not going in to get something from the confrontation you're going in to give something and that completely changes your posture going into it which is going to change their posture because they don't feel attacked they're probably going to you know they may respond um, because they're insecure and they feel bad they might lash out at you because they're mad because they feel terrible about themselves but in general they're, gonna, they're not going to feel like you're coming after them to get something they're going to see you're coming because you love them and and, uh, and you've already forgiven them. You're coming with a gift that they don't deserve. And that's just humbling. So, yeah, that's, that's powerful. But on the bottom of 161, this is the great problem. He kind of gets at it. If everyone else says you are beautiful and your spouse says you're ugly, you will feel ugly. Your spouse's opinion of you can be a terrible weapon. And then over on the next page, 162, halfway down, there's the great problem of marriage. The one person in who the whole world holds your heart, the one person in the whole world who holds your heart in her hand whose approval and affirmation you most long for and need is the one who is hurt more deeply by your sins than anyone else on the planet. 
And this is a great problem in marriage. The one we long for love and intimacy the most is the one we hurt most when we sin. And, uh, and man, that's just hard. It just is. It's like, man, I don't love anybody more than that girl over there in 310 North Flint. And when I, when I sin against her, I hurt her unlike anybody else can. And it's like, man, that's, that is the great problem of marriage, is the power, the same power that we have to build up and to bring out the future glory self. We have that same power, if wielded incorrectly, is the power to absolutely destroy our spouse. And uh, so that's, the, that's what he's getting at, the great problem. And so he, kinda, he summarizes some of that. When love is withheld, the statement of the truth doesn't help, it destroys. So when we speak the truth without love, then we're just destroying. So we tell somebody, you're the, you're the worst sinner that I know besides myself. That would be true of you and your spouse. But you do that without love, you're going to destroy them. Verse, you know, we're chief of sinners together, but God is making you beautiful. That's just a different interaction. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's, that's, that's really, really, that's, that's concerning. That's, I think it's help. We need to know it because we need to understand the power of our words in our marriage. That's why I got on the tangent a while ago about the negative comments. It's because it's, these are rip somebody's heart out comments power. And so we can't just flippantly throw words around that are, it's, it's you know, bullets that are flying in those moments and wounds that are happening that they're going to need to be surgically removed when they land. And uh, so we, gotta, we, we, need to, we need to know that. Um, flip side of it, if I come to realize that my spouse is not really being truthful with me, then her loving affirmations become less powerful in my life. Only when I know that my spouse regularly tells me the truth while her loving affirmations really challenge me. So on the flip side of it, maybe you're the guy who never says anything negative to your wife and you only heap praises and she just don't even take them serious anymore. They don't land. Because she knows she's not perfect. And all you ever do is tell her how amazing she is and like she walks on water. And she knows she don't. And so your words are kind of empty at this point. Because there's, she knows, like you, you have thoughts in your head about me that you are not sharing. And she may not consciously think that, but she knows it. And so then when you say, you're awesome, there's something in her that's like, you don't think that. And so we got it. There's, again, you can, do, you can do all truth and you're just going to destroy. You can do all love and then it's flippant and, and fluffy and it doesn't carry any weight. So we've got to have truth in love. We need to feel so loved by our partners that when they criticize, we have the security to admit our own faults. All right, so the power of grace. <clears throat> so 163... 164 all the way to 166 uh, the power of grace first sentence there truth without love ruins the oneness and love without truth gives the illusion of unity but actually stops the journey and the growth the solution is grace and then a couple, the next sentence down after that um, skip one only if we are very good at forgiving and very good at repenting can truth and love be kept together and so I'll just stop there and ask you are you very good at loving or at forgiving and repenting you know, I, I've heard it said, uh, um, and I believe this is true biblically speaking, how do you measure spiritual maturity? So how do you know what a spiritually mature person looks like? You know, if you're just trying to figure out, you know, like, man, that's a godly person. Well, what are you looking for? I mean, I think there's a number of things you'd be looking for. Fruits of the Spirit from Galatians 5. You're going to be looking at holy, personal holiness. and You're going to be looking at a number of things. But I think actually the, the best thing you could look for in Luther... Luther would say a massive statement. Luther would say all of, all of the Christian life is repentance. So you want to know what a mature Christian looks like? They repent a whole lot. So counterintuitive. We think the mature Christian doesn't have to repent because they got it all together. The scriptures paint a different picture. The mature Christian is the one who leads in repentance. So they're convicted of their sin, they confess, they repent, they ask for forgiveness consistently. And so this is, this is what's awesome. It's even connecting to the message this morning. God loves using ordinary sinners. Because ordinary sinners realize they're sick and they need a Savior. And so then when Jesus starts changing them. And so if you want to know what maturity looks like, a lot of times it's, well, how often do you repent? That's how mature you are. How often do you confess that you have failed God and others and you ask God and others for forgiveness and you turn from doing that what you were doing? In a lot of ways, that's the, that's the best way to measure spiritual growth. Are you willing to confess your own sins? Or do you hide from them? Do you pick on sins of others and you hide from your own? Or do you lead in repentance? And so I would challenge all the men uh, in your home, lead in repentance. If you don't lead in anything else, you lead in repentance. I promise everything else will fall in line if you'll do that. If you'll be the chief repenter of your family and you show them what it looks like when you fail to confess your failure, to ask for forgiveness, 
and to turn from your sin and to trust in Christ. You do that. You be the chief repenter. And I promise your home will, will begin to function much more like it should. And so if you're going to lead, if you're mature, lead in repentance and then in forgiving others. Now, if you lead in repentance, your ability to forgive others will be a lot better. Because you're going to know, I'm a pretty big sinner. I'm having to confess and repent all the time. But Christ's love is for me there all the time. Never once have I repented and Christ said, nope, I've had enough of you. <laughs> Christ always embraces and says, come home to the prodigal. Every time the prodigal comes home, God throws a party. The father throws a party. Kill a fattened calf. My son, once lost, now he's found. He's come home. Let's throw a party. That's how God responds to repenters. And so David says in Psalm 51, a, a, a contrite and broken heart you do not despise, O Lord. God doesn't despise a broken and contrite heart, a person who's broken of their sin. God embraces those. He says, come here. And, he, and then he encourages and affirms and says, my blood has covered your sin. You're free. You're no, you, you, don't, you won't take the penalty for those sins. So come back to me. So repentance is a turning back to Christ and getting closer to him. And so you do that, I promise forgiveness becomes a lot easier. Because then you know, I'm, you feel like, Paul, I'm the chief of sinners. And so your wife says, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? And it's like, sure. Like, like, do you know how much I'm having to confess and ask for forgiveness? Like, I'm the chief of sinners. I understand what it's like to need forgiveness. So I, Christ keeps giving it to me so sure I can give it to you. And so again, I just ask you, how good are you at repenting and forgiving? In general, um, just know everybody's probably sitting here feeling like terrible. I'm terrible at it. And, and so that's where it's like, so let's grow together. Let's, let's learn to confess our sin. Let's, let's learn to be more annoyed by our sin than our spouse's. We'll have better marriages for it. And, uh, and maybe, let me throw in one little freebie here. Again, I got all this free time, so I'm just, I'm just unloading on you all these random, random thoughts. Um, wifey would be like, just let me, sorry. Um, Clint, stop, I need to go journal. Um, and I forgot what it was. Uh, what was I saying? Confess, repent. Oh, well, let's keep going. The, the spirit took it away from me. There we go. <coughs> or my tired-minded but all right um how good are you forgiving repenting um i'm searching i'm going through all the files double clicking and i can't find them how good are you forgiving and repenting what were you talking about what did i say right before you met? anybody remember have y'all tuned me out already you're done with me <laughs> all right let's just keep going then there we go you'll get it some other time all right, page 164, 165. Anything stand out to you guys? Yep. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I think uh, on 165, it says, one of the most basic skills in marriage is the ability to tell the straight, unvarnished truth about what your spouse has done and then completely, unselfrighteously, and joyously express forgiveness mm. without a shred of superiority, without making the other person feel small. And um, I think I've noticed that a lot, just being able to, for both of us to be, be able to say, hey, this, this is something that you've done and it did hurt me. And then instead of just kind of, casting it off like it's okay it's all right but actually even for us even saying i forgive you and mm. you know, looking at each other in the eye when we say that things like that that that's something that stood out to me that you know that one way i can repent is if i know more deeply what i'm doing wrong mm. absolutely yeah and, and what happens in those moments is your your ability to believe the gospel is so increased because what you realize is wait a minute if this human being can hear how wicked I am and really forgive me, God really does do this. Like, she wouldn't otherwise. <laughs> like, and, and so you realize the, the unconditional love is true. It is out there. It is in Christ. And I'm seeing it and experiencing it through my spouse. And so this is, again, where you, early chapter, Keller talked about marriage explains the gospel, gospel explains ma marriage. Is in this context you begin to understand more and more of the of the unconditional love of, of Christ. So that's great. Thanks, Luke. <clears throat> Just uh, back to um, what Cindy was talking about. You know, on November one sixty four, 
the Bible says we're supposed to forgive people, then go confront them. The reason we're surprised by this is almost always because we confront people who've wronged us as a way of paying them back. If you go on down the last sentence of that paragraph, you're not really telling the truth for their sake, you're telling it for your sake, and the fruit of that will be grief, bitterness, and despair. And so again, this is, when you do that, what you're doing is saying, I want to be, I want to grieve, I want to be bitter, and I want to have despair. And so this is, this is what's helpful about the gospel is there is a God change me because I don't want to do confrontation where it brings me grief and, and makes me bitter and, and goes into despair. That's, that's not a gospel life. That's not healing. That's not rec- reconciliation. That's not redemption. That's not the Holy Spirit changing somebody. That's, that's more and more misery. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's the opposite of where I want to go. And so, God, let me get my heart right before you and forgive before I go so then this confrontation would bring love and understanding of unconditional uh, embrace that the, the gospel makes, makes possible. It gives kind of warnings there on top of 165. Your marriage will go either into a truth without love mode with constant fighting or shallow love without truth mode in which both partners simply avoid the underlying problems. And so there again, there's the truth without love, love without truth, the, the extremes of where you can go. So if it's truth without love, you're just always fighting. You might be saying true things to each other. The problem is there's no love. And so it's just a fight. Or if you're saying all loving things, there's no truth, and so it's just a shallow, you just don't face reality. You just, you know, you got a whole herd of pink elephants in your house, and you just don't look at them. You just pretend like they're not there, and, and it's just kind of a, a shallow existence. All right. Um, but grace, he talks about grace. What does grace take? First, it takes humility. If you have trouble forgiving someone, it's at least partly because deep in your heart you're thinking, I would never do anything like that. That's your problem. You're wrong. Oh, bam, here we go. There's the freebie. It came back. There we go. Um, it's connected to this. Um, let me give you a little inside thing that's going to make you really uncomfortable. Typically, the sins that you hate most in other people are the ones you struggle most with, and you don't realize it. So the things that drive you crazy, they probably do because they're so inside of you. And so you look at other people, and you harp on what they do wrong, and in your heart, you're the exact same way. And some other category, maybe it fleshes itself out in another category. But, it, but it's you. And so you just hammer them as if you would never do that. And if I knew you long enough and we would talk long enough, I would find places you're already right now doing it. And this is true of everybody. It's true of all sinners. So you don't, nobody gets to squiggle out of this one. It's kind of like if you're in the room, you qualify. And everybody who's not as well, they just can't hear me. Um, but this is, this is reality. Usually it's the sin in others that... It's, and it's because we see it so clearly. It's easy for us to see because we, we fight it internally. Now, we might not do it on the surface, but let me give some examples. So it might be, um, you know, maybe it's you, it drives you crazy when there's a person who is, um, you know, like the star of the, the, the show all the time. They just like being up front. They like being in front of people, and you're like, oh. They drive me crazy. They're always wanting attention on them. They always want people looking at them. And, they, and it's like, you're probably, they're driving you crazy because they're getting what you want. Usually that's some of what's going on in your heart. And now you would never think that because you're judging them so harshly. But the reason you're judging them so harshly is because I would never do that, which then makes you think, and I, so therefore I deserve all that praise they're getting. I deserve all the attention because I would never do that. See, you're, you're, you're in the, anyway, so a lot of times, not always, but a general rule of thumb, no. If you find yourself hating a particular sin in somebody else, you might want to look in your own heart. That's the whole um, splinter and plank parable that Jesus tells. So you've you got this, this plank in your eye you're swinging around knocking people unconscious with because you're wanting to pick on some splinter in theirs. And it's like, well, if you quit knocking me unconscious with yours, then maybe you could reach over and help me get it out. But the problem is you keep beheading me with, your, with the plank in your eye. And so that's the point of that parable is to say, a lot of times the sin that we see in others so clearly is the one in which we have a plank and they got a little splinter and we hate that splinter in, in theirs because there's something in us that knows there's a plank coming out of mine. Anyway, freebie right there. So what does it take to know the power of grace? First, you've got to be humble. So you've got to know the thought, I would never do anything like that is a lie, period. You would. If God didn't give you grace, you would do the exact same thing, if not worse. So if you just start at a place of humble posture, you've got a lot better shot at receiving grace than if you start with a place of pride. And then he goes on down and says the second thing you need is a fundamental inner joy um, with confidence. If you're very down on yourself, you struggle with self-loathing, then it may be far too important for you to have your spouse always pleased with you. You'll not be able to bear to have your spouse upset with you at all. 
and that will mean you'll not be able to, to criticize your spouse or explain how much he or she hurt you. So if you're always self-loathing and you just need nothing but praise, nothing but praise, 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 then you're never going to say anything negative to your spouse because you're afraid that will lose you the praise you're after. So again, both sides, same coin. You've got to be careful both there. Flip over to 166. Um, <clears throat> and um, see then that to wield both the power of truth and the power of love in the life-changing, integrative, balanced way that should be used, it takes deep humility and yet profound joy and confidence. Where in the world can you get that? The answer is that it must come from outside of this world. Unaided, our human nature is incapable of producing them in combination. Without an experience of God's grace, people who feel they have succeeded in life feel confident or but, not, but are not humble before others who are wrongdoers. People who feel they have largely failed in life are humble but not confident and joyful. But the gospel transforms us so that our self-understanding is no longer based on our performance in life. That's massive. The gospel transforms us, again, why are we going to be about the gospel and all we do? Because it helps us understand your worth is not based on your performance. Your worth is based on Christ's performance. You have value because Jesus knocked it out of the park for you. You struck out, he hit a grand slam. You threw 17 interceptions, all pick six, and he threw nothing but touchdowns. It's, he knocked it out of the park for you. You failed. So the, the, your confidence does, is to be built in his performance, not yours. And so this is why we have stability. Even when our life is up and down, our confidence is still in his performance because his performance is not up and down. So he goes on. Um, the gospel trans transforms us so our self-understanding is no longer based on our own performance in life. We are so evil and sinful and flawed that Jesus had to die for us. We were so lost that nothing less than the death of the divine Son of God could save us. But we are so loved and valued that he was willing to die for us. The Lord of the universe loved us enough to do that. So the gospel humbles us into the dust and at the very same time exalts us to the heavens. What a sentence. The gospel humbles us to the dust and at the very same time exalts us to the heavens. We are sinners, but completely loved and accepted in Christ at the same time. All right, so then it goes on. Um, you can't create this power. If you see Jesus dying on the cross for others, um, okay, this is massive. When you go back and picture Golgotha. A lot of us, that, the, the elders, um, inactive elders, the deacons, and then some folks have just read Mahaney's book, Living the Cross in Her Life, were really struck by this paragraph. But um, there's a paragraph where he talks about what happens kind of at the cross. When people are mocking Jesus, and so he talks through different characters. He talks through Pilate, talks through Herod, talks through the, the Jews yelling, crucify him. He talks through um, the thieves on the cross. He talks through, and, and kind of, and then, then he kind of says, now, where were you in that story? I think typically, when you remember back to and picture Jesus on the cross being crucified and people yelling curses at him, where do you portray yourself in that story? <clears throat> What Keller's getting at is here is if you, keep reading it, if you see Jesus down on the cross for others, forgiving the people who killed him, that can just be a crushing example of forgiving love that we, you will never be able to live up to. But if instead you see Jesus down on the cross for you, forgiving you, putting away your sin, that changes everything. So if you remember back to that cross and you just remember Jews yelling at him, and you don't see you yelling at him, you miss it. If you don't see you saying crucify him, crucify him, you throwing rocks at him and cursing him, saying, if you're God, get yourself off there. That's who you were in the story. That's who I was in the story. That's who we would have been. And so if you don't look back and, and remember it correctly, and you just look back and remember it from here, and you think, well, I wouldn't have done that. Well, you just don't know how wicked you are. That's the, that's, that's, the very, that's the reason you have pride. Or that's, or that's the pride in you, is that you, you picture yourself always the good person in the story and never the bad person. Once so we read back to that story and realize we would have been right there with them yell and crucify him. And so instead of seeing Jesus forgiving those wicked people that were doing those wicked things to him, you see Jesus forgiving you who was doing those wicked things to him. It changes everything. And so now all of a sudden everybody's on level playing field. Wounds are on level playing field. The ability to forgive is on level playing field because you don't picture yourself as better than those bad people. But you actually realize that's, that's who uh, I am. That's where I would have been. Instead, if you see Jesus down on the cross for you, forgiving you, putting away your sin, that changes everything. He saw your heart to the bottom but loved you to the skies. And the joy and freedom that comes from knowing that the Son of God did that for you enables you to do the same for your spouse. It gives you both the emotional humility and wealth to exercise the power of grace. 
So again, when we talk about being gospel-centered or cross-centered, this is why. If you live in the right perspective of the cross, it changes all of your life. You get that one thing wrong, everything else will be out of whack. You get that one thing right, everything else falls into place. And so as you, as you understand the gospel, your marriage can come into uh, proper order. So then the ultimate power, this last section, one, uh, 167, 169 there. <clears throat> Any, anything sent out to you on 167? Let's just flip page to page. We've got a few more minutes. Page 167, anybody underline anything or anything stand out to you guys? I'd like to read um, read the first paragraph in that next little section too. Marriage has unique power to show us the truth of who we really are. Marriage has unique power to redeem our past and heal our self-image through love. And marriage has unique power to show us the grace of what God did for us in Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, Paul tells us that Jesus laid down his life for us, forgiving at great cost to make us something beautiful. And because he has done it for us, we can do the same for others. Our sins hurt Jesus infinitely more than your spouse's sins hurt you. You need to believe that sentence. Your sins hurt Jesus infinitely more than your spouse's sins hurt you. And if you get that, then there's a res- reservoir of grace that you're going to be able to go to to forgive those sins against you. Because they're real sins. Your spouse has hurt you. It re- he or she really has. And they're real wounds and they're real sins. You just hurt Jesus a lot worse than your spouse hurt you. And so you can run to all the forgiveness he's given you and then offer that to your spouse. So it's kind of like you owed God a $7 trillion debt. And he forgave you. And then he put $7 trillion in your account. Your spouse owes you. And, you know, they blew up at you, got really angry at you. She owes you $7,000 worth of debt. It's a real debt. Substantial amount of money. Jesus forgave you $7 trillion, And he put $7 trillion in your account. You can go to that account and take 7,000 of that 7 trillion out and forgive your spouse. So that's the picture of understanding the gospel. If we understand the gospel, we've got 7 trillion in the account. If we don't understand it, then we're, we're playing games, measuring and competing. And it's all out of our made up, you know, categories of who's worse and better and all that. So anyway, that's what he's getting at there. You may feel your spouse is crucifying you, but our sins really did put Jesus on the cross, yet he forgave us. And he tells us an awesome story about that Tsar of Russia such a cool story um, and then he pays it uh, pays it in full uh, the czar will pay the full amount for my own personal funds to make up the difference found in this book um, to save the guy's life so the guy don't commit suicide what a picture of the gospel such a great illustration there of what Christ did you've gambled away you've done all the sins and he comes and pays it for you so you don't die what a, what a picture of the gospel here's why you can say to your spouse who's wronged you I see your sin but I can cover it with forgiveness because Jesus saw my sin and he covered it this, again, this is the reservoir you can do it. It's because the Lord of the universe came into the world in disguise in the person of Jesus Christ, and he looked in our hearts and saw the worst. And it wasn't an abstract exercise of Jesus. Our sins put him to death. When Jesus was up there, nailed to the cross, he looked down and saw us, some denying him, some betraying him, and all forsaking him. He saw our sin and covered it. I do not know of any more powerful resource for granting forgiveness than that, and I don't know of anything more necessary in marriage than the ability to forgive fully, freely, unpunishingly from the heart. A deep experience of the grace of God, a knowledge that you're a sinner saved by grace will enable the power of truth and love to work together in your marriage. Um, And then lastly, on on 169 there, and we'll finish up with this. Um, Spiritually discerning spouses can see a bit of what God does in their partners and it excites them. The rest of the world sees us wrinkling up, but using marriage powers and the grace of Jesus, we see each other becoming more and more spiritually gorgeous. We are clothing, washing, adorning each other. And someday the whole universe will see what God sees in us. What we should say to each other on our wedding day is, as great as you look today, someday you will stand before me with God, before God in such beauty that would make these clothes look like rags. That's awesome. Because we, uh, we, get, we get fancied up for weddings. But, but on that day, we will look like we were in rags. So there's, there's the hope. That's where we're going. Um, let me pray for you, and we are out of town. Christ, again, we just thank you for this opportunity. Um, I just love knowing that we're doing this, Lord. My marriage needs it and is benefiting from it. I know that others are. Uh, God, I know that some in the room feel like this is helping them go from uh, lukewarm to thriving marriage. 
Uh, there are others in the room that uh, feel like they're disappointed that maybe their spouse is not here or um, not interested in the conversation or um, that they're you know, divorced and, and left alone or single and looking for marriage. Um, but I just pray you'll give hope and, and give a picture of what this is to be. And mainly that I pray they'd be so encouraged by the gospel that they have you. And uh, if they have nothing else, they have you. And they have all of you. And you have all of them. And it, uh, there's such hope and joy in that alone. God, I'm sure others in the room are <clears throat> still teeter-tottering on will they open up uh, Pandora's box and actually have the first conversation. They've probably been coming for a few weeks and, and still are afraid to actually talk about their marriage because they're worried what they might find. And I just pray that, that they would believe that there's hope and that their marriage can thrive, that, that uh, their marriage can sing, um, and that you can make them into their future glory selves through one another. And there's hope. And that uh, even 12 months from now, they could be a completely different couple. God, I thank you for... Um, the experience with my parents uh, a long time ago of seeing that happen, that transition happen, and how they are um, just best friends and, uh, and partners in the gospel and growing with you and with one another happier than they've ever been. And, uh, and just a decade ago, it, that looked like that would never be an option. And so I just pray if there's anybody in that scenario that you'd be using this class and this time um, to bring hope and that they would, uh, they would commit to one another and to you and that you would restore and heal. Uh, anybody that would, that would be in that scenario and that if the elders or myself could be of help that they would be willing to reach out and ask for it and I thank you for those who have already done that and for those you are already helping and growing and uh, we just thank you for this chance to do this you are a great God who transforms people by the gospel for your glory and we thank you for uh, that being true and we praise you Holy Spirit for your work in Jesus name, Amen